Yes, you have found the Sales Hunter podcast. I'm Mark Hunter, the Sales Hunter. And hey, today we're going to be talking about what great sellers do and others won't do. Now, if you're going to have a topic like this, that means you've got to have a top one percenter in the studio with you. Joining me right after we get going, Carson Hetty. He is the top one percent. And I say he is because let me tell you something. He has got the awards and the recognition to make it all happen. Hey, so why don't we roll the show and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Sales Hunter Podcast with Mark Hunter, where the focus is to help you as a sales leader sell with confidence and integrity. And now here's your host. When it comes to closing deals, Calendly knows how important maintaining momentum is for your sales team. Calendly provides the automation you need to connect with your best leads faster and schedule every meeting throughout your sales cycle. Prevent scheduling delays that stall deals and let your team focus on what they do best driving revenue. Request your demo of Calendly today. Hey, you just go to Calendly.com backslash the sales center. Okay, I got a special deal right there for you. But hey, right now we have to get to what great sellers do and others won't do. And to help us achieve that, a top one percenter, Carson Hetty. Welcome to the show. Hey, tell the audience a little bit about your background and why I say very vehemently, you are the one percent. Mark, you're way too kind. And thank you. Uh, this is kind of a dream come true for me just to sp share the space with you. So thanks for having me. Um, a little bit about me. So uh, Carson Hetty, uh, I would consider myself a lifelong student of selling. Uh, I've got a lot of background with some large organizations and some small organizations uh, during my time as a sales executive all the way through uh, management and senior leadership. And so um, I've got a few books that uh, I've written over the years, but haven't sold enough to retire, hence why um, I'm still carrying a bag and out there selling and doing and having the time of my life doing it at that. So uh, really fortunate to be here today with you, Mark. Well, I tell you what you are, you are a, you are carrying a quota and I love that about you. And so this isn't, again, somebody who did it one time years ago. No. And you, it, you're at that top 1% year in and year out consistently. You are always at the top of the food chain. So what is it? What is it that great sellers do and others won't do? Give us a, a mic drop moment and we'll end the show right now, right? Here no, you go. No, no. Let's do it. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, but fortunately, I thrive on that. So mm -hmm. um, no, that's a great question, Mark. And, and you know, what's funny is how my answer to that evolves over time. Because when I was uh, in my 20s, I probably would have said, you know, it's charisma, and personality that really made all the difference in the world when it comes to selling. But I've seen a lot of people come out of the gate strong and not flourish over time. The biggest thing really is that resilience um, and also scrappiness, you know, that ability and willingness to do the things that maybe others aren't do. Um, figuring out what are those controllable variables. Uh, and I, I go back to saying being a student, being a student of the selling game, uh, know your playing field. Every playing field is different. But the reason that I've been successful in each playing field that I've been is because I understand all the things that I can control and the things that I cannot. And I try to dismiss those as much as I lean into uh, the things that I can control. Um, you know, how I prospect, how often I prospect, who I'm reaching out to, how I'm reaching out to them, and then just the consistency of my execution over time. And those are the things that have served me well. I think perseverance and scrappiness and really just doubling down on relationships and resources is what puts you at the top. Okay, you could be driving north on I-95, just north of Fort Lauderdale. Go ahead and put the car in reverse, back it up, and listen to the last 45 seconds of what Carson shared with you. He just gave you what it takes to be successful. But I'm going to chime in on one thing right now. You said the variables that you can't control. I find average and low performers spend all their time focusing on that. And then they use those as an excuse as to why they can't make quota. So let's, let's leave that aside for a little bit. But... How do you stay focused on the variables that you can control? It takes a lot of discipline and focus, Mark. I was actually listening to a podcast recently uh, from one of my fellow St. Louis natives, Mike Weinberg, and Jeb Blunt talking about that very thing, about it's so easy to get sucked into that vortex of complaining or pointing at the things that you can't control, like how your quota is set or uh, just different economic factors or you know, whether or not this executive will answer my outreach, those things I can't control. 
But what I can control is I can control the quality of my messaging. I can control what I say when I try to engage or to get that conversation. I can control the number of outreaches that I make. The biggest deal I've ever closed, I reached out to over 500 people in that organization and closed a nine-figure deal. It was We were not even the incumbent, not the favorite. Uh, it was a very competitive scenario. And uh, they changed seven C-levels during the time that I worked with this organization. All things I couldn't control. But what I could control was the relationship and uh, how I showed up to earn the right to be the trusted advisor. The last thing you can control in that big three is consistency of execution over time. I can control how and when I do the, the quality touches, the prospecting, you know, how I stay top of mind with prospects and how I react and respond when they need something. If I'm communicative and transparent, then I've earned the right to be that trusted advisor. See, I love what you said there because you closed a nine figure deal, but it was 500 connections. And again, that's mileage that very few salespeople are willing to put on their, their keyboard, so to speak, in terms of reaching out, picking up the phone, making the calls, getting on the airplane, whatever it does, whatever it needs to be done to get it done. And again, we're talking today with Carson Hetty, who is number one, he is a top one percenter. So when you hear what he says, take this to heart and ask yourself, are you willing to go the extra mile? Now, there's something you haven't talked on because you've talked about really the consistency and the focus. Where does your own mindset come into play? <laughs> that is yet another of those things that you can control. And I love that you hit on that, Mark. Mindset is so important because it is ultimately what is going to make people continue on doubling down on the process and the people, which again, that's really the most important thing. Um, I can tell you, I'm just a small town kid in the Midwest United States. There's really no reason why I could or should be successful um, at the very large company that I work at today. Uh, but the reason that I am is because I'm very resourceful. I've doubled down on knowing who are the relationships that I need internally and externally and with our customer organizations. And then also all the resources that I can bring to bear. And those are really the big things that I can control. But I have to have the mindset to really commit to the discipline, to the process, and to execution. You know, when I first started working here several years ago, um, you know, I remember the first six months, it felt like everybody was talking a different language than I was. I had zero technology background. My, my background was in telecommunications and advertising. Um, I was just a student of selling, right? So it took me some time to really understand the uh, the nuances, the idiosyncrasies. Um, I liken it to a baseball diamond. You've got to know exactly where to hit that, that bloop single or the pop fly because you don't always swing for the fences. And mindset is everything in that game. It's the determination and willingness to go out and do what you know that you need to do, to execute it over time. And also when you lose, because you will lose, what are you going to do from that point in time? Um, I go back to Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. And uh, one of my favorite quotes in that book was around, most people find success after the rest would have already given up. Hey, that, that right there is a drop mic moment for several reasons. Now, you quoted a, 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 you quoted a book that was written many, many years ago by Napoleon Hill. And people today would say, oh, if it wasn't written in the last two years, it's not relevant. Whoa, here's a top one percenter going back and saying this is the fundamentals of what works. Now, you got to do a quick shout out because you talk baseball. And I know you've talked baseball with uh, our good friend, Mike Weinberg, because Indeed. you're both cardinal fanatics but we won't talk about this year it's okay it's okay there's all there's always next year Ooh, that was a cheap dig wasn't it but hey i want to come back to this thing because you go on long after everybody else will give off will give up is there ever a time that you do give up that's that's a provocative question mark and i think knowing uh, you know, I'm going to go back to the archives again, uh, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them is also very important. You've got to make sure you're picking priority activities, high impact, high outcome activities um, in a lot of cases, as opposed to chasing every deal as if it were like for like. Um, so I do think that there are times where you uh, move on from a deal. I do think there are times where you move on from trying to make a uh, particular scenario work, whether it's could be with your occupation, 
could be with a uh, potential client. Um, there's always going to be times where you you know, you look forward to different types of opportunities, but in the grand scheme of things, doesn't mean you quit or give up. And I think that's the key delineation between the two. Um, I also really like the fact that you pointed out these older texts, like a Think and Grow Rich as an example, because I've been a student of a lot of people call it social selling, digital selling. I've employed a lot of these mechanisms over time. But I think the one key element that's got to be pointed out here is the fundamentals of selling don't change. It's all about people. It's all about mindset. It's all about relationships, how you create them, nurture them, invest in them, and then how you use every resource at your disposal to show up with value. And I think those are our governing principles and those things do not change. See, I love what you're talking there because, again, so many people try to – they get into trouble. They're not hitting their number. So they go chase the shiny object, and they think it's their job to reinvent the world. No, it's not. <clears throat> but, again, you go back to what you said at the beginning. You're a student of sales. You're a student of learning. So there's always tweaks. There's always things that you're going to be doing. You talk about social selling. Gee, Napoleon Hill didn't even know what that term was when he wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. But again, you you adapt and you insert. Hey, we got some people chiming in. Lisa Chase has been chiming in and, and, and she raises several great questions. She says, hey, uh, does Carson have a walk up motivational song he likes to play prior to approaching the plate? But I'm going I'm to twist this a bit. How do you start your day off? Because I've always found top one percenters have a very defined way as to how they start the day. Yeah, uh, up at 4.30 every morning. Um, I and the, One of the nice things about the pandemic was I created my own home gym. So I'm in the home gym. Uh, I used to go to the gym. Now I'm here just in case, you know, my wife or the kids need me for something. Uh, but I, you know, work out for at least an hour, um, help with getting the kids up and to school. And then it's, uh, you know, off to the races, you know, some, some, uh, some caffeine. And, uh, you know, then it's... Uh, in front of my in front of my desk to see what what I need to get done uh, for the day. So um, and, and reading, you know, news sources. Right. I like to be very informed. I've got a lot of email alerts that are set up for industry specific titles and uh, some of our top customers. That way I just I'm in the know as far as what's going on. But I love the question about music. And um, in fact, I was on a show once that uh, the question was around, like, you know, if you were picking your like top five mixtape, what would it be? And I really enjoyed that question. But if I had to pick one, it goes back, and this is for sentimental reasons, and it's going to sound really cheesy. But when I was a sales rep, when I first started, I got into sales by accident. I like to I like to call myself an accidental salesperson. And uh, I thought I was going out for this customer service gig, and it turned out it was very um, demanding, one call close environments. And I was glad that I, uh, you know, cut my teeth on that. But I had to listen to something every morning to like psych myself out so that I could like get in the mindset to be successful that day and make those hundred dials back to back to back. So I listened to You're the Best Around from the Karate Kid One. And so that song for me, it like just something about it, cheesy, I get it. And hey, maybe I can say that more freely in the advent of the popularity of the show Cobra Kai. But uh, that song, for whatever reason, did it for me. Okay, now again, the, the, I, I like you for two more reasons. One, <laughs> you get up at four thirty in the morning. That's what time I get up. I get up every morning at four thirty in the morning, and and two, you're into caffeine because I am desperately into caffeine. Gotta have but it. you have your set routine every morning, and I know every morning by about four forty, I'm working out. I've got a small home gym myself, and that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. But I found that top, and every time I talk to a top performer. They always have a very definitive routine that they start the day with. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you a little bit here in a second, but we got to do this, this comment real quick. We want to say thanks for listening and thank you, Calendly, for sponsoring today's show and continuing to help sales teams focus on driving revenue. Prevent scheduling delays at stall deals and let your team focus on what they do best, driving revenue. Request your demo of Calendly today. Okay, now I, I said I want to push a bit. I bet you have a set routine throughout the day. I bet there are certain things that you consistently do, activities you repeat over and over and over again. Is that true? False? Well, very much. You you have to, you have to, Mark, because it sets the foundation for your day. It's uh, something Paul Riley and I did a show not too long ago, and that was the big quote that came out of that was, "You can't feast until you set the table." 
And you have to set the table for these foundational components of your day. So for instance, you know, we talked about kind of that morning routine element and don't get me wrong. Like there's absolutely days that are just absolute crap shoots where you're, you're back to back all day. It's a good busy, um, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, but like, for instance, in the morning, especially when I'm on the treadmill or I'm, you know, getting ready to start my day, I have to plot out my non-negotiables for the day. Those are the things that if I don't get them done, then the day was a failure for me. And so I ensure that even if I'm weaving in and out in between calls or whatever it is, I get those five to 10 things done every single day. That's very important. I also go through my schedule and I ask myself, is everything that's on today, is this mission critical? Is this something that I've got to do today or could it, should it wait until another day where I can prioritize my non-negotiables? Um, and sometimes you have to have a lot of discipline in order to be able to do that. It's There's an element of selfishness that has to come into that to say, look, I would love to do all of these things today, but it's just not feasible to do it. And then the last thing is, you know, as the day comes to a close, looking at that next day and peeling back some of the same elements. You know, sometimes it's confirming the meetings, because as you well know, sometimes when you're confirming a meeting, somebody may back out, things change, variables change. Uh, you want to kind of know what you're going into before you get there. Wow. We are brothers of a separate mother. I mean, this is so funny because, again, like you you. You mentioned earlier um, how you fell into sales. I did not want to get into sales. I talk about it in my book that I got into sales only because I got too many speeding tickets. I couldn't afford car insurance, but that's a separate story. Anyway, but it, again, you lay out tomorrow before you end today. And again, you, you, you are ever so mindful about protecting your time. Because again, this is if you're if you're listening to this, think about this. Your number one asset is not what you sell, not your customers. It's your time. It's your time is the most critical. And you keep a lock on it. Yeah, I, I know it's kind of funny because you and I bounce back and forth for a long time to try to get connected. Sure. And because we're both busy. And it just we're just not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, you know, even though it's Carson Hitty and Alan <laughs> Parkham. Yeah, yeah. So again, how do you discern yourself? in terms of those last minute changes you got to make? What, 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 you know, cause you use the term mission critical. Yeah. How do you define mission critical? So you don't get sidetracked going down a rabbit hole. Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. Cause it's, it's super important. Everybody's approach. I want to point out is going to be very personal to them. You know, you want to look down your day and you want to ask yourself, you know, is this something that this, is this a conversation that needs to transpire today? Um, I'm the same way with my book of business or with my pipeline. I'll go down each and every customer name or each and every deal. And I just ask myself, is there something that I need to do today to move the ball down the field? Is it I need to message a customer? I need to message a partner. I need to have an internal conversation so that I have the next step planned out. Am I on track for the mutually agreed upon milestones? Um, and so all of those things have to be in play. And often that's what fuels my non-negotiables. That way that I know like, hey, I'm furthering this deal today. I know that I'm having this, this important conversation with head of procurement or CFO or, you know, whatever that looks like. So a lot of it is just that ability and, and it's a, you know, might be an uncomfortable muscle at first, right? Like a lot of things in selling or career or life uh, where we have to develop it over time. Um, but I go through and you just, you have to be honest with yourself. Is this a conversation that needs to transpire today? Uh, if it's not, then respectfully reaching out to that person and saying, hey, today, today is a little frenetic. Um, you know, might we connect this coming week where I can give you the attention that you deserve? Uh, something along those lines. Um, you know, those are the types of things that I try to apply on a daily basis to make sure that I'm protecting my most valuable asset, but that I'm also able to get to most everything that I need to get to. Because not every day is absolutely crazy. Um, some of them are, uh, but that way it will actually help you to push that to a time where you'll be more present for that conversation as well. I want to back up there because you said something really key. You will occasionally reach out to a customer and say, it just doesn't work in your own calendar? Not connect. a customer, not a customer. So it's a good question. Not a customer. Okay, okay. That's what I want to get clarification on. Okay. Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, I would say if a customer conversation comes up, even if I have any other conversation going on, those are the ones that I will prioritize. So, okay. you know, it's often, Mark, where I may be double, triple, quadruple booked in a given day, but I always err on the side of the customer. So if there's a customer conversation to be had, that's the key one. Or obviously somebody on my team, right? If somebody that works for me needs to have a conversation, we've got a scheduled uh, sync, 
or they need me for something. Those are the types of things that come first in my work life. Um, the things that may move is, you know, let's say somebody wants to have an informational about a role. Um, I'm very fortunate. A lot of people reach out to me wanting to work with me, for me. Um, I can't always take all of those conversations in you know, one day, one given week. Um, recently, I had a posting that went up and I had 300 messages. Um, I'd love to meet with every single one of them, but it's just not possible. So um, trying to find the time where I could uh, or gearing them toward a different set of process, there may be another path that can be taken so that it isn't you scheduling all of that time, which would be virtually impossible. But, um, you know, from time to time, things come up, different partners, they have questions. These are conversations that you want to get to, but I've got to err on the side of the customer and my team first and foremost. Wow. I, I, I love what you're saying. We've got some great comments coming in from people who are watching this online right now, and it's absolutely terrific. Here's a question I, I, I want to ask. What would be the number one thing you would tell an average performer who says, I want to become a top performer? What would you say they need to do now? Or, or I should say, start doing every day. Yeah, I mean, look, it's for me, it always goes back to relationships and resources. Ask yourself, what do you want to get done this year, next year, whatever it is? map out the relationships that you're going to need in order to achieve that. Do you have them? Um, I always tell my team, you know, hey, what are the things that you want to achieve this year from a deals perspective? Go out and map out the 10 relationships that you think you're going to need in order to achieve that result. And then 10x that. Um, that's always been my mantra, Mark, is that it isn't that's why I'll reach out to hundreds of people in one organization to create the groundswell that I need to be at the pulse of that organization. So it's it's reality that you're control the controllables, you know, focus on the, the big three, the quality, quantity, and consistency, but map out the relationships that you're going to need in order to be successful. And then understand every resource at your disposal. Because as sellers, we have to show up around value. We have to show up armed with value with the resources at our disposal. And then we have to set ourselves apart from all the rest. And those are the key attributes of a successful seller. You have said so much there again, back up, back up the audio here, listen to it again. And I heard quality, quantity, and consistency. And again, you are locked in. Hey, we got to wrap up the show here in just a bit, but how do people get in touch with you there? How, how do people follow you? Because you share a lot on LinkedIn. No, thank you, Mark. Um, LinkedIn is a great place. I mm -hmm. uh, love to connect with people and, and um, you know, always enjoy learning from sellers around the world. So uh, please do reach out on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect. Great. Hey, with that, we want to say we want you to thank the great people at Calendly for their sponsorship. If you're ready to get control of your calendar and book more high value meetings, then it's time to get started with Calendly. See the link in the show notes. We'll put it down there. Hey, I do trust you value the content shared and you'll take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. And hey, would you leave us a review on your favorite podcast app? Each week, we you get to do you get to hear two shows, one with just me and one with a great guest like today's guest, Carson. Each week, we bring to you a guest you can learn from. Hey, this is the Sales Hunter podcast. My name is Mark Hunter, the Sales Hunter. Yeah, you get that. And hey, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Great listening.